my dear students welcome to epg patashala program i am professor tyagarajan the head of the department of sanskrit presidency college chennai who is going to discuss about the prose and champu kavyas in sanskrit which forms the part of the paper aesthetics and fine arts we have already seen in other modules regarding the kavyas which are classified as ಶ್ರವ್ಯಕಾವ್ಯಾಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದೃಶ್ಯ ಕಾವ್ಯಾಸ್ ಶ್ರವ್ಯಾಸ್ ಆರ್ ದಿ ಲಿಟರರಿ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಆರ್ ರೆಡ್ ಆರ್ ಹರ್ಡ್ ದೃಶ್ಯ ಕಾವ್ಯಾಸ್ ಆರ್ ದಿ ಕಾವ್ಯಾಸ್ ದಟ್ ಆರ್ ಡೆಪಿಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ನನ್ ಅದರ್ ದೆನ್ ಡ್ರಾಮಾಸ್ today we are going to see a further classification in the shravya kavyas they are padya kavya gadya kavya and champu kavyas padya kavyas are the compositions made by the poets with meters so it is only a metrical presentation in the form of verses prose is in the form of sentences in champu kavya which we are going to deal with it later in this module has prose and poetry mixed together now we are going to see what is prose and who are all the prose writers in sanskrit literature prose writers are so meager in sanskrit literature when compared to poetry writers they are only handful and we can say that only a few have gained the popularity too bana harsha and other writers have contributed to prose section of literature in this module we will find out what are all the prose kavyas and in that also what are the historical kavyas and then we will see what are champu kavyas as regards prose writers we will discuss about bana subandhu and other writers and in champu kavyas also we will find out very very important authors prose works are called gadya kavyas in sanskrit as i told you already they come under shravya kavya dandin defines a prose as that kavya which is free from metrical lines in the vedic literature several brahmanas and upanishads are written in prose in puranic literature also there are some narrations that are carried on in prose but during the later ages prose work was used only as a medium of commentary on works of philosophy and grammar patanjali's mahabhashya and the grammatical sutras of panini and shankara ramanuja and madhvas commentary on 
ब्रह्म सूत्रास ऑफ व्यासा आर ऑल इन प्रोस द महाभाष्या ऑफ पतंजलि इन पर्टिकुलर इज कंसिडर्ड द बेस्ट स्पेसिम ऑफ प्रोस ड्यूरिंग द एलियर पीरियड इन द बिगिनिंग ऑफ द क्लासिकल पीरियड देर वॉज ए पॉजिटिव ऑफ प्रोस वर्ड्स वर्सेस और पद्य काव्यास वर फाउंड इजी टू रिमेम्बर एंड प्रोस वॉज नॉट therefore prose was not recognized to be the vehicle for the thoughts of the poets moreover extraordinary talents needed to compose prose as preponderance of compounds with epithets piled upon one another has been spoken as the very life of prose little narration and more of description are considered as the characteristics of prose it was therefore more hard for a poet to compose prose than verse see there is a saying gadyam kavinam nikasham vadanti what does it mean that a prose is a touchstone for the poets that means it will test their ability test their imagination test their way of presentation etc gadyam kavinam nikasham vadanti it was easy for those writers to compose in poetry but most of the poets have miserably failed to compose prose why even kalidasa has not attempted to compose any prose work it may be due to the fact that they were having easy way of rendering their wit and wisdom through poetry than prose but some writers like banabatta have excelled in composing prose and they stand as the example for composing prose in sanskrit patanjali in his mahabhashya mentions three prose works vasavadatta sumanottara and bhaimrati without mentioning the author's name bana in his arshacharita praises the akyayika and mentions one battara harichandra without mentioning his prose it is clear that the prose was already in use but the earliest prose written purely with literary purpose now available to us belongs to 6th and 7th century ad only now let us see how the prose work has emanated the composition the art of composing prose has emanated according to earlier scholars like bamaha prose works are divided into two classes called katha and akyayika in akyayika according to bamaha subject matter is the actual experience of the writer the narrator being the hero himself the story is told in pleasing style divided into chapters called uchvasas and containing verses in vaktra or aparavaktra meters the story must indicate a future happening scope may be allowed to poetic invention and the theme may also embrace subjects like abduction of a maiden fighting separation and the final triumph of the hero this must be completely in sanskrit so there are two divisions katha and akyayika we have seen and the grammar of it now in katha the subject is generally an invented story so one has to invent some story and then he has to narrate it in the form of prose he should not be a hero as in the case of uh, akyayika there is no divisions called uchvasas or no vaktra or aparavaktra meter 
slokas may be composed in arya meters the language may be either sanskrit or apabhramsa also dandin the author of kavya darsha criticizes these divisions of prose into katha and akyayika and considers these requirements not as essential but more or less formal the prose works of bana dandin and subandhu are considered to be the most important prose works in sanskrit regarding which we are going to see one by one dandin the great grandson of barvi regarding whom we have already seen in another module that as person who has written the work kirata arjuniyam and who has also gained the title as chatra barvi who is noted for his artha gaurava so he is such a person to whom is born as the grandson so barvi he is also a scholar and the dandin who hails from his family is from the scholarly family tesakumar charita as the title itself suggests deals with the adventure of an young man of whom three were princes and seven were the sons of ministers this prose as it is available to us now consists of three parts purva petika dasakumar charita proper and uttara petika the purva petika in five uchvasas deals with the birth of the ten boys and their coming under the care and protection of king rajahamsa and the adventures of two young men the proper dasakumar charita deals with the story of eight other young men the uttara petika a short chapter contains the story of the lost young man left unfinished in the dasakumar charita proper dandin is undoubtedly and unquestionably a master in his views of language he is already acclaimed as a person who could render beautiful sentences that's why he was given the accolade or the praise in the form of dandinaha padalalityam so it is as if dandilano alone could handle lalita padas he is perfectly capable of using simple and easy narrations he is beyond doubt a master of prose style and it is a pity that his model was not taken by the later writers who chose the complicated style of bana and subandhu this dandin is assigned to later half of 6th century ad now we come to subandhu who wrote vasavadatta the work this work is totally different from the swapna vasavadatta of basa that's a drama whereas this is a prose as he has been that subandhu has been praised by bana of 7th century ad in his sarsha charita he is generally assigned to first half of 7th century ad His prose romance Vasavadatta describes the story of Udayana legend made famous by number of Sanskrit poets. So in Sanskrit dramatic literature Udayana legend is very popular. Of course this Udayana Udayana legend emerged out of the legends narrated by Gunadya in his brihat katha and different uh, versions of brihat brihat katha stories have been brought out by chemendra dadas the general theme of this arsha charita appears to be falling in love of passionate hero with a heroine and their fi- final reunion after a series of romantic adventures in which dream vision taking parrots magic steed voice from the heaven are all introduced though his descriptive power is appreciated by all his 
constant search for poetic concepts puns and apparent incongruity makes his work more tiresome here i want to say that subundu noted for his puns claims that pratyachara shleshamayam kavyam idam he says he has made pun in each and every letter perhaps his claim is held high by him but the hair splitting puns used by him had not reached the readers there is perhaps one among the reasons that the this particular work vasavadatta and the author subundu have not gained popularity as banabatta now we will think about banabatta he is the author of two kavyas one happens to be historical kavya that is harsha charita the other one by name kadambari is a prose romance in his prose harsha charita bana gives an account of himself and his family he was patronized by the general great king sri harsha of 7th century ad he wrote his great prose romance kadambari he has also written a historical prose harsha charita in literary merit kadambari is supreme there is a statement appreciating this work kadambari kadambari rasagyanam aaharopi narochate if a person is interested in kadambari he won't be interested in taking food because kadambari means liquor as well as honey also in some places they have used it as honey also whatever may be the case if liquor or honey makes one forgets himself so does the romance kadambari not only that he is claimed as a great writer who covers all the subjects just like mahabharata wherein you find discussed all the subjects banabatta also discusses that's why banabatta as uh, style uh, is praised as bano chistam jagat sarvam so the entire world has been completely described by him and there is nothing remaining out of the purview of is writing in his prose this work kadambari is rhythmical his long compounds are clearly built all the native critics praise his gadya kavya while he is criticized by the westerners for his style because according to the westerners banabatta always resorts to repetitions he says the same thing with the different synonyms but it is not so just for the sake of rhythm he is combining long sentences and at same time when he is giving the synonyms you must know that he is first of all profound with vocabulary and he wants his readers to understand the synonyms that he uses appropriately in the descriptions so his gadya kavya do criticized has to be appreciated but unfortunately it is said that banabatta could not complete his kadambari fully and died and it was taken up by his son bhushana bana who completed the second part but at same time he could not excel his father 
in the presentation moreover in this work in the structure of the work is that the first part of the work will be so big the second part will be so small perhaps the reason is that his son bhushan bhatta felt that my father took up this work and without finishing it he died and if i am continuing i may also die without uh, finishing it therefore he wanted to quicken the process and he ended it in a simple way so the second part happened to be very small now coming to harsha sarita the first important of decidedly historical nature is the harsha sarita of banabutta belonging to 7th century bana begins his narrative in five uchvasas but it is left unfinished bana gives about himself and his family in this work as i told you already now let us see another work vikramanka devacharita towards the beginning of 11th century ad in the court of king chalukya vikramaditya a poet by name bilhana patronized by the king wrote his historical kavya vikramanka devacharita this poem describes the history of king vikramaditya in 17 cantos it begins with an account of some of the predecessors of chalukya dynasty and then narrates the story of vikrama in vikramanka devacharita the historical matter occupies only a minor portion the poet mingles much of the imaginary with real the supernatural element plays an important part in the story and the intervention of lord shiva in the affairs of the hero is of frequent occurrence in spite of all these bilhanas vikramanga devacharita is considered as one of the most important historical kavyas he has also written an erotic lyric chaura panchashika and a drama by name karna sundari raja tarangini this is a work by kalkana a great poet this work is of uh, historical importance he lived in kashmir and has recorded that he lived during the reign of jayasimha of kashmir between 1127 and 1129 ad kalkana wrote his great work raja tarangini describing completely the history of from the period of ashoka till the end of his uh, own time it is said kalkana took his source from nilamata purana which is considered early chronicle of kashmirian history even in raja tarangini there are some marvelous episodes which are not believable under ordinary circumstances with all these defects raja tarangani remains to this day the most important historical kavyas in sanskrit literature in the same 12th century ad another poet of kashmir by name jalkana wrote his historical kavya somapala vilasa describing the history of the king somapala who ruled rajapuri in the neighborhood of kashmir vemu bupala charita is another work following the examples of bana vamana batta bana of 15th century ad wrote his uh, historical kavya vemu bupala charita of viparnara or viparnarayana charita he was also called abhinav batta bana in his poem he has described the life and victory of vemu bupala or viparnarayana the poet's patron himself born of srivasa gotra vamana claims a kinship with bana and styles himself as one who can refute the popular belief that bana could not be equaled in writing beautiful prose his imitation of bana is very close and in spite of want of originality vamana's work contains many passages of considerable merit another work prose work is by mathura by name mathura vijaya written by gangadevi 
she is the only recognized poetess in those days in sanskrit literature and even up to day we are able to see only kappa devi this ganga devi was the queen of kampana the son of mukka for one who ruled at vijayanagar this work of ganga devi that is mathura vijaya is incomplete the royal poetess as described her husband's exploits kampana's expedition to the south and his conquest of mathura so a queen writing about her husband and his exploits he is something admirable and unique and therefore in sanskrit literature ganga devi stands as the unique poetess before we learn something about champu kavyas let us have some idea about the authors banabatta and others whom we have discussed we have been telling that banabatta is more or less a versatile genius has covered all the subjects and used all the literary phenomena in his work he is undoubtedly a great poet of prose in his harsha charita he has got a, a style of narrating beautifully the river mandagini as an instance of his poetic merit i want to quote the style of bana while he is describing about the fall of ganges from akasha which is called as akasha ganga he says twangat tungat tarangat tarat tarala tartar tarakam how he is using the melodious rhythmic sentences not only that he echoes through sounds the sense also the meaning tatha kramena dhruva pravrtam dharma dhenu meva adho dhavamana dhavala payodharam udhvara dhvanim antaka madana mouli malati malikam aliya mana malakilya ruddha rodasam arundhati dauta taravatvacham twanga tunga taranga tarat tarala tartar tarakam just like that he continues what he wants to say his idea or the intention or the dhvani the suggestive idea in him he is to convey to the readers the purity the sanctity of the ganges and the association of ganges with the divinities and sages and also the sound that is echoing the fall of the ganges the meaning of the sentence which i have made is that this agasha ganga starts starting from dhruva nakshatra tatha kramena dhruva prutam slowly it starts from dhruva dhruva pravrtam how it falls down dharm dhenu mive adho dhavamana dhavala payodharam having the weight adder as if the kamadenu is just diving from the akasha to the earth dharm dhenu mive adho dhavamana dhavala payodharam the how the river flow is there udhvara dhvanim is making a sound noise like that 
that is called udvardhuni udvardhuni now how the water falls where from it falls andagamadana mooli malati malika andagamadana means that is the destroyer of andaga asura that is shiva shiva is having some garland over his head it is touching that garland and falling from his head also andagamadana mooli malati malika ஆலீயமான வாலகில்லிய ருத்தரோ தசம் ஸோ இந்த ரிவர் த வாலகில்லிய ரிஷிஸ் டைவிங் டீப் அண்ட் பிளஞ்சிங் மேக்கிங் இட் எ பியூர் வாட்டர் அருந்ததி தவுத்த தாரவத்துவம் அருந்ததி இஸ் நோட் அண்ட் ஃபார் சேஸ்டிடி இட்ஸ் அ பொயட்டிக் கன்வென்ஷன் தட் வெனவர் தே ரெஃபர் டு அருந்ததி தட் இட் இஸ் ஃபார் சிக்னிஃபைங் தி சேஸ்டிடி Arundhati is said to be always looking at the toe of Vasishta, her husband, without allowing her eyes to roll about seeing other, others. So such a chaste lady comes and dives deep into the water and then washes her clothes. So it is so chaste. Tungat, Tungat, Tarat, 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 Tarakam. He is echoing the sign, sound. How? It is falling over the mountain, falling down, up, down, up, down, like that. And it is reflecting the stars in the sky. So, such a beautiful description is found in Banabatta. Now, we will come to Champu Kavyas. Champu means Champayati, Champati, Iti Champu. Thus, descriptions or the definitions are found. But yet, Champu Kavyas means the mixture of prose and poetry. Gadhyab, Padhyab, Mishritam, Kavyam, Gadhyamidhya, Vidhiyate. Madhvika, Mridhvika, Yoho. It is another definition. It is just like mixing two sweet Drakshas and Madhu. Such a sweet thing. So it is a combination of prose and poetry. It is a narrative in mixed prose as I told you. Powerful picturesque descriptions are expressed in verse while the narrative part is carried on generally in prose. We have got instances in Puranas where prose comes amidst verses. verses. But There are more instances in classical period of this recognized class. It is only after the age of Mahakavyas and the prose romance that the Champus could have begun to rise. But after 10th century AD, Champus became very popular and they were largely composed in South India. Trivikram Bhatta is an author of a Champu Kavya who belonged to 10th century AD. He mentions Bana in the introductory verses to his work Damayanti Katha or Nala Champu. So he is the first person recognized as the author of Champu who wrote Nala Champu. Boja of 11th century AD, the author of Saraswati Kantavarana mentions this poet. This is an incomplete work with the seven chapters. According to this poet, Ordinary expressions are not appreciable for poetry and so long and cumbersome compounds, fears of double meanings are abundantly used in this work. Now we come across another champu called Eshasthilaka Champu by Somadeva. Hari Kaisari of 10th century AD belonging to Chalukya Reyes patronized the poet Somadeva who wrote this Eshasthilaka Champu. In seven Aswasas, that means aswasa means here chapters the book relates the story of king yashodara lord of avanti his conversion to jaina faith his assassination and rebirth the last three chapters are the explanatory or the sacred text of jainism there are plenty of moral and ethical sentiments in this work which makes it more a didactic composition than a literary performance. Boja's Ramayana Champu 
Boja was the celebrated king of Dara, ruled between 1018 and 1063 AD. Ramayana Champu or Boja Champu or Champu Ramayana is ascribed to Boja. An uncertain tradition says that Boja composed the prose portions and Kalidasa the verses, which the later was temporarily recalled to life by the magical power of King Boja. Boja composed only up to the end of Sudrakanda, while Lakshmanakavi of some later date wrote the Yuddhaganda. All kinds of meters are employed and the prose portion is full of long compounds after the manner of Gadhi Kavyas. The poetic sentiments and descriptions are fine though familiar. This champu is very popular among the lovers of Ramayana. Then we come across Bharata champu written by Anantabhatta. This work has a fairly wide vocabulary and a great variety of figures of speech and meters. This has beautifully summarized the Mahabharata. He seems to have written Bhagavata Champu also to complete Abhinava Kalidasa. Narayana Bhattatri, the author of Narayaniyam, quotes frequently from this Champu. He belonged to the 15th century AD. Abhinava Kalidasa's Bhagavata Champu. We have already said that there is a Champu called Bhagavata Champu written by Abhinav Kalidasa, who belonged to Vallala family from Andhra Pradesh. As the name signifies, it is dealing with Bhagavata. He has also written another Champu by name Abhinav Bharata Champu. He lived during 11th century AD. Now we come across Chidambar Kavi, regarding whom we have already seen in when we talked about Shravya Kavya where he has written the Trisadhana Kavya, Raghava Yadava Pandaviya. The same Chidambar Kavi of 17th century AD, patronized by King Venkata I of Vijayanaga, has composed Bhagavata Champu describing the story of Krishna. Panchakalyana Champu, written by him, describes simultaneously the stories of the marriages of Rama, Krishna, Vishnu, Shiva, and Skanda. It's really wonderful. In one verse, he is able to give five stories. He has written a Mahakabya by name Raghav Pandava Yadaviya. Next, we come across Kumar Samba Champu, written by Raja Sarfoji. One. Raja Sarfoji. One who ruled Tanjur between 1715 and 1727 AD, a great pattern of poets and an artist, wrote his Kumar Sambhava Champu. It bears close similarity in language and subject matter to the poem on the topic by Kalidasa. Nilakanta Dikshitas, Nilakanta Vijay Champu. Nilakanta Dikshitas Champu. Describes in five chapters the story of churning of milky ocean by Devas and Asuras and the part played by Shiva to save the world by taking the halahala poison which arose out of the ocean. This episode accounts for Lord Shiva's name as Nilakanta. His style in Shiva Lilarnava is very simple and graceful while that in the Champu is full of long compounds. Of course, it is required while you are narrating in prose. Then, we come across a peculiar champu, Vishwagunadar's champu. It is the device of presenting this champu itself is so novel. It is written by Venkatadri, who lived in the later part of the 18th century. He was uh, the son of Ragunata, and Shitamba, his Champu, Vishwagunadar Champu, is popular. In this, two Gandharvas, that is Vishwasu and Krishanu by name, fly over the earth in their aerial core. So, this concept itself is something new. Two persons travelling on the aerial core. 
debating the merits and defects of several important places of pilgrimage, professions, institutions, etc. One of these two Gandharvas, Krishanu, always condemns them on several grounds and the other Vishwavasu, after refuting him, points out the merit and the greatness. So that Krishanu is always looking at the negative side of anything he looks at. And Vishwavasu is a positive approacher. He looks the brightness of things in everything. So, it is a novel idea by the poet to reveal the good and bad, the merits and demerits of the subject that he has chosen by expressing through two different characters. Thus, in the form of a dialogue, the poet's opinions about the brighter and dark sides of things are also brought out very powerfully. This work was intended to expose the fault in the customs and manner of his time. Then, Dhyavandara Champu, written by Harichandra. He is a Jaina person and he tells the life story of Jivaka or Jivandara. Of course, this work is of artificial type. Now, in this module, what we have seen? We have seen two segments. One is prose and the other one is chump. Prose, of course we know, it with long compounds, Banavatta, Dandin and other writers have attempted and succeeded. Though most of the writers were afraid of touching upon prose writing. And with regard to Champus, of course, it is just like Kathagala Chepa nowadays, that uh, there is a song and then narration, song, narration. Here also in Champu Kavyas, we find verses and then narration in prose. And the entire sentences, sentence is composed in rhythmic style. She is more attractive. So we can uh, say that uh, the modern days Kathagala Sheba emanated from the type of Champukavyas of Sanskrit. With this, we come to the end of this lecture. Thank you.